Okay, hello, I'm Ariane. I'm gonna be talking about modern carbon burial rates in seagrass sediments. By modern, I'm meaning uh, centennial, on a centennial time scale. Um, before starting, I would like to apologize because some of the estimates I'm going to show today might be a little bit shocking, but well, you'll see now. Okay, seagrass meadows are increasingly uh, being credited with um, varying large amounts of quantities in their sediments. Although they cover a relatively small portion of the coastal ocean, uh, their carbon sequestration um, contribution is estimated to be over 10% of the total carbon burial in the oceans. So the carbon sink function occurs when the rate of carbon entry into the system through photosynthetic transformation of plant material and eventually to the sediment is greater than the rate at which this carbon leaves the system through export or respiration. Here are the current estimates on uh, local carbon burial rates in seagrass sediments. As you can see, these estimates, each of these estimates took slightly different uh, methods to estimate these rates. Um, some of them, like uh, the net community production, are not necessarily meaning that this carbon is um, stored in the sediments for long term. So the point of, of the carbon sink function, where we are looking in, in like blue carbon science, is um, this long term storage. Because when the plant material gets buried, uh, the point is that it's under the water column, there's low oxygen. So uh, this carbon is stored as reduced carbon and can stay there for millennia. But uh, carbon accumulation is a matter of time scale, right? Because when we measure carbon in sediments, we are measuring the carbon that is um, available today, but not what was deposited uh, the day that, that, that it was deposited. So uh, there are different techniques to measure that. In the short term, um, we can have uh, the sediment traps and sediment elevation tables or marker horizons that they are working with uh, shallow samples and they are telling us uh, the short term carbon sink in these systems. But then there are other methods like the dating of sediments. So if we are ascribing dates to a sediment column, we can estimate carbon accumulation rates uh, in a centennial time scale, for instance, using uh, lead to 10 or cesium 137 method, or if we want to operate in a millennial time scale, we can we have carbon 14 dating, right? So, what I did is um, I looked in the literature for um, published estimates on carbon accumulation rates, and we realized that there's a paucity of estimates on carbon accumulation relative to carbon stocks. Um, most of the estimates that exist in carbon burial rates come from carbon-14 or lead to 10 dating. So what I did in my thesis is um, estimate these carbon burial rates uh, to kind of like enlarge this number here and have more data. So with the, what was available in the literature, and combining it with our data set, uh, with, with the work we've been doing, uh, we compile this data set. Um, for the data in the literature, we were looking at publications that were estimating carbon accumulation rates, but also, um, if that was not the aim of the study, we were looking for carbon content, dry bulk density, and led to 10 sedimentation rates in these systems. If these measurements were not reported, but some others like accretion rates, carbon density, or organic matter, we could estimate uh, back this, and then we could estimate carbon accumulation rates as um, the carbon content into the same of the sediment column multiplied by the, by the mass accumulation rate. Uh, when we had all these estimates, we organized our results in bioregions. So, um, as I said, two important measurements for this sink capacity in seagrass sediments is the carbon content. So the carbon content uh, in seagrass sediments in our data set had a mean of about 2%, but it was, it was similar than that reported by Jim Furcuri in 2012 in its global um, review of uh, seagrass carbon stocks. So the median is a little bit slightly lower, but we could say that our data set it's kind of representative of the carbon content that is in cigarette sediments globally. And then in terms of carbon, I'm sorry, in sediment accumulation rates, 
um, the results are telling us that seagrass are accumulating sediment at a rate more or less that ranges from 1.17 to 1.23 grams of sediment per square meter per year. That this would be equivalent to a 2 millimeters year. That is what um, Duarte actually reported in his review in 2013 with available estimates in, uh, derived from carbon-14 and lead to 10. So this data was confirmed by other studies and it was out there. Right? So here, what I'm showing is the seagrass uh, distribution and then the red data points are uh, the sites where we could and have data. So most of the, well, I wanted to highlight that um, these data come from an, uh, 114 sediment cores that come from a total of 44 sites. Most of the sites, though, came from Australian seagrass meadows and the Mediterranean, and then followed by seagrass meadows of the uh, temperate North Atlantic and tropical Atlantic, and also some regions in the tropical in the Pacific. Then we had really few sites for the temperate North Atlantic and the Arctic region. But in contrast, we couldn't find any estimate in the coast of Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, or the West Pacific. And most importantly is that there's a huge data gap here in Southeast Asia. And for us, this is a huge data gap because um, Segras meadows of this region represents like a large proportion of the seagrass area, area globally. So that's why it's, it's like a huge data gap. So these are the preliminary results uh, of this study. Here I'm showing the carbon accumulation rates in seagrass sediments and uh, in the different bioregions. These estimates are the mean in each bioregion. Uh, here I would like to put some emphasis in this region here. This is the tropical Atlantic. And here uh, we have like the highest, but extremely high carbon accumulation rates. Here I would like to highlight that the majority of the sites, not all of them, but the majority of them come from a particular place that is called Florida Bay, right? So in Florida Bay, um, we have a, a really particular setting that is um, enhancing sediment um, deposition and because we have the Everglades and also like extend seagrass meadows, altogether it's contributing to this uh, huge sequestration capacity of seagrass meadows. Also these sites here come from Shark Bay, which is another hot spot for carbon storage uh, regarding seagrasses. Anyway, despite the large variability that we are observing, the central tendency is telling us that seagrass are accumulating carbon at a rate of about 20 grams of carbon per square meter per year, and most of them yeah, would range between 16 and 25. So assuming that 50% of this carbon that we find in sediments come directly from uh, plant tissues, and based on uh, published estimates of net uh, community production, um, we will be, we, we'll see that we see that about 10% of the net community production of seagrass meadows is preserved and buried in situ on a centennial time scale. What happened with the rest of the 90% of the net community production? We don't know, but it can be consumed, it can be remineralized, but I think the most of, of it is exported somewhere else. So this is the famous figure of um, Magliot 2011. Um, here uh, it's showing the carbon accumulation rate in different ecosystem types. So if we include the estimates, if we, include, if, we, if we update this figure with the estimates of this study, but also the estimates that have been released in mangrove and salt marshes, the new updated figure would look like this today. And in case of seagrass, um, the carbon accumulation rate in the long term, it's uh, seven times lower. So here, yeah, I want to apologize because I would love that this rate would have increased uh, for blue carbon science, but um, this is what, what we are finding in many places. But the take home message is not that cigarettes are not efficient in sequestering carbon because if we are looking at this figure, Still, seagrass are four times uh, more efficient in sequestering carbon than, than are terrestrial forests in this case. Also, because 
uh, if we upscale uh, this estimate to the global seagrass area, uh, we will be seeing that uh, globally seagrass uh, store between 3 and 15 million tons of carbon each year. And if we take like the central estimate and then uh, we combine it with that estimate of mangrove and salt marshes, uh, we see that seagrass are contributing to about 20% of the total carbon that is buried in vegetated coastal habitats. They are contributing to a 5% of the carbon that is um, buried in coastal oceans and to a 4.5% to the total oceanic carbon burial. This is uh, still lower than the 10% I showed in, in, in the first slide, but taking into account that these systems uh, only occupy about 0.1% of the global uh, coastal area, this is quite significant. And then to finish, um, I would like to highlight that so that cigars accumulate carbon at rates um, lower than, than estimated previously. That doesn't mean that the carbon stocks in cigars meadows are low. No. So the carbon stocks in cigars meadow are about 140 tons of carbon per hectare. And this is the result of the accumulation of carbon of many, many years. Right? In, uh, in one article that was published recently, uh, Lovelock et al. modeled um, in 2017 modeled the carbon loss in seagrass ecosystem if these systems were disturbed. Right. So they estimated that for seagrass, the loss rate of the sediment carbon was about one to four percent each year. So if we take this estimate, we will be looking at the potential loss of uh, carbon that it's between 10 and 30 times higher than the rate that this carbon was buried. So the take home message here is about conservation. So conservation of seagrass meadows is important for many aspects, but is crucial to avoid um, future emissions. And yeah, just to finish, so conservation of seagrass ecosystems is important because their, potation, uh, their, their potential to release the carbon to the atmosphere is at least 10 times higher. Uh, than the rate at which a healthy meadow um, sequesters the carbon. Um, we finally have uh, the first significant data set that talks about long-term carbon burial rates. And with that, we can be like more certain of have less uncertainty in, in what cigarettes are, are doing or what not. And, and then to compare it with other systems. And of course, there are many uncertainties in upscaling our results, but also there's a potential for large variability as we have seen that there are systems like Shark Bay or Florida Bay where the rates of carbon accumulation are higher or more or less the same that are uh, in mangrove ecosystems. That's it. So we may have time for just maybe one question. Hi. I'm just wondering, while the studies you've reviewed, do they use the same methodology for percentage of carbon, of any carbon, and dating? Do they all use the same methodology? All of them use uh, lead to 10 dating. And then for the carbon, either they had direct measurements of carbon that they analyzed uh, with a CN analyzer, or they do it through uh, LOI. So they analyze the organic matter, and then they have Mm, I mean, looking at the large variability that we have already, in like geographically, I don't think that little changes in the amount of organic carbon would change that much. No, not not significantly. Okay. Um, um, oh, yeah. Good. Uh, I think that there are going to be some hot spots around the world, and those will have put a lot of the carbon in sequestration and then there are going to be some other areas that are very low and it, it what when we went to calculate the Gulf of Mexico we found from estuary to estuary there were huge differences Different. even though the extents might be the same the carbon was quite different right, in seagrasses from one estuary to another so I think the best way for us to be working toward is to accumulate at least some of these hot spots, and I agree that the Southeast Asia is missing a hot spot, yeah. Yeah. and along with the 
the tropical Atlantic and, and the tropical Pacific. Okay. okay. Yeah. I agree, actually, like there's a huge data gap from the equator to 20 degrees north and south. That region is like there's nothing, at least um, regarding carbon accumulation rates in the centennial time scale. There's things about carbon stocks, but I wasn't able to find anything related to carbon accumulation rates.